I, let me direct, because it's such an interesting topic from a career perspective, from a science perspective. You're, I mean, you've spoke, you've been brave in, you know, telling your story, not some dramatic thing, but just telling the things you've seen. Did it encounter, did, uh, did it impact your career? Is that why more people haven't come out? Like uh, you've mentioned uh, Roswell, like how, what advice do you give to people, to the community, to me as a scientist, for ways to go forward about this topic and still have a, a you know, not being put in a bin in society that he's a loon or she's a loon or that person. Mine is to get away from the little green men. Just to, to divorce the two little green men. And, you know, and I've talked to Lou Elizondo about this, you know, and, and the group that they're working with, which is incredible. I mean, they've got Steve Justice, who used to run Skunk Works, where they built, you know, projects. Now, Lou Elizondo, as you mentioned, was a program director. He ran so, the ATIP program at the Pentagon. And ATIP was a program that was tasked with investigating any kind of uh, un, uh, UFOs, UAPs. Yeah. So what's funny is the unofficial official report that I joke about, yeah. the guy who wrote the unofficial official report was actually an original member of ATIP. And the original stuff that ATIP did was FOIA exempt. And people go, how do you know that? I go, because I stood there with the memo in my hand that said these are, it, it literally, I watched the DOD memo that said it and it was signed. So he was one. So that's why the, that's why I call it the unofficial official report. It was never, it was never releasable because people go, oh, I put in a FOIA request and I didn't get that. I go, well, just because you put in a FOIA request and get it. I go, because how much, how much time do you think that guy's going to spend to get you the information that you requested if he can't find it? I actually got called by the Navy. I had a, a commander in the Navy call me about uh, right before the article came out in the New York Times. It was this was starting to come back, and she had called me because there's been there was a FOIA request for stuff about the Nimitz incident. And I said, "Do you know of anything?" She called me. She goes, "Do you know of anything else besides the the situation reports that come off the ship?" And, you know, and you got to remember when the situation report comes off the ship, that's like third hand. So we tell someone, they tell someone, that person has to write it up. So there's all kinds of inaccuracies in it. But then there's the unofficial official report that's actually pretty well written. There's some errors in it, but it was, you know, I didn't help write it. I just did it. And he did a really good job of researching it and figuring out who's who in the zoo and the players. Mm -hmm. um, so she called me and said, is there anything out there? And I said, officially out there. She said, yes. I said, I don't know of anything. I knew of the unofficial official report, which is that one. But I'm not, you know, if you don't know about it, I'm not going to tell you because that's not my job. And nor did I care. I mean, did in that whole situation you, you mentioned, Lou? I mean, did you think about your impact of your career? Like, just to get back to the question, did do you think others, other pilots, other thing, other people like in the Roosevelt are thinking about this kind of thing? Why aren't they talking about this? Why are people afraid uh, to talk about this? Uh, well, honestly, the, the military and the press, there's a distrust. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, we typically don't like talking to the press because if I talk to you, you know, especially when I do uh, even the TV shows, you know, cause I've been on a couple of shows when you look at it, you, you know, they come to my house and they film me for two hours. Yeah. And, and then and what you see on the screen something. is five minutes. Well, and the, hours. and the other thing with the press, let me give you my perspective from autonomous vehicles is the clipping happens. Yes. But also the incompetence. Let me just call out journalism. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're not thinking. They're, I mean, so so here's the thing. I've uh, I have a PhD, and I've taken painfully too many classes from uh, like physics, and math, and I've also have a deep curiosity about the world. I read a lot. That seems to be missing with journalism. So you're talking to a person who is not going to push the story forward in an interesting way. Not the story, but the actual investigation of. Uh, perhaps one of the most amazing things that humans have witnessed in history. Like, you, it might have been nothing. It might, who knows? What you witnessed might have been, from a sort of debunking perspective, might have been some kind of trick of mind. You've, you and others have hallucinated something. There could be some simple explanation. But possibly, it was uh, something not of this world. And to not do justice to this story from a scientific perspective, it, it seems at, at best negligence. And so, yeah, well, that's true for journalists. That's true for other scientists. We, it's just, a, it's human nature. Yeah. If we, if we can't, if we see something that we can't explain, 
then sometimes if you just, eh, it, maybe it's just yes. me and you let it go away and you don't think about it, and, you know, maybe it'll just, it, you know, it's, you, it's, you ignore it. Um, the yeah. other side is the inquisitive mind that says, well, what was that? And I want to, I want to dig more into it, you know, and if you, you, you look at it or you're going against the norm, um, you can get ostracized, you know, and if you look at, you know, and Einstein's the perfect example. I mean, when he started coming out with some of his theories, some of the top physicists in the world were like, dude, you're, you're a nut job. And he's, he's literally proving them, but he didn't have, you know, he proved them in theory, but he didn't have the means to actually do the experiment to prove his there, theory. There's a great book that I recommend people read called Proving Einstein Right by Jim Gates that uh, talks about like, the hard work that people try to do years after uh, to try to experimentally validate the predictions that Einstein made with uh, with his theories. It's fascinating. But yes, at the time, it's kind of crazy what he's saying. Yeah, if you look at it back at the time, don't we, we look at it now and go, well, the guy was a walking genius, and he was. But if you go back in time when he was doing it, it was like, what are you talking about? You know? And but one of the challenges is, your eyewitness, one of the challenges is you're essentially an eyewitness account. Like we don't have good data. We have very limited data of um, of the incident that you've experienced. So let me kind of dig in. Let me just ask some questions of uh, maybe to see if there's, just to paint more and more of the picture. One, you kind of mentioned, so tic tac shape. Let's break apart two situations. One is the video. Let's look at the actual eye account, the the eyewitness account that you saw with your own eyes. Mm -hmm. What's the what can you say about the shape of the thing? Is there interesting aspects outside of the tic tac? Like, is there any appendages? Is there um, some texture to it? That no, smooth white tic tac. You know, we don't <laughs> so you don't smooth... see. There's no no wings, no visible propulsion, no windows, when no. You probes that we could see. We don't notice, like I said, we don't see the little things on the bottom of it until we see the video in the TV mode when it's zoomed in right before it's shortly, you kind of see them zoom in. You don't see it typically on the YouTube stuff that's out there. Um, yeah, but, but remember, we're looking at the original tape, so there's not, the, the, there's basically no degradation. But when you saw with your eyes, there's no kind of appendages. No, none. W what about like somebody asked, a lot of people asked you questions, so uh, I appreciate you spending your time here. Let me ask some of them. Uh, did you, I mean, you chased it, so we flew close to it, relatively speaking. Was there, did you feel any wake? Like any, did you feel it in any way in terms of your interaction, like aerodynamically? No. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so uh, another aspect of it, there's an interesting thing. You've developed a feel for for objects in the air. Did you feel like it was surprised by your arrival, or did it? Let me ask a few questions around it. So, did you did it feel like the thing was surprised? Did it feel like it wanted to be seen, almost to show off its capability? Did uh, and did it? What did it feel like relative to if you were doing a um, uh, an air fight against uh, sort of like a I don't know a, a foreign jet? So one, I think it I think it knew we were there when we showed up. Uh, it's just it's me. Uh, it's kind of like an animal. If you've ever been around deer in a field, you know the deer will look up and if it sees you and you're on the other side of the field. It'll actually go, no threat, and it'll start eating. You know, they don't put their tail up. As you move closer to the deer, then it goes, oh, it's there, and I'm going to react or I'm going to move. So as we were up high and it's down doing whatever it was doing, um, you know, which I don't know, someone asked, what do you think? I don't know, maybe it was communicating with something. I joked on Good Morning America. Maybe it's like talking to the whales, kind of like Star Trek, you know. <laughs> and I actually used that clip. It was kind of funny, but... Yeah, um, we're a little human-centric. We think like it would it, it show up to talk to us. But maybe he's yeah. talking to the dolphins. Maybe it was, yeah, it was to whatever, you know, because it was hanging around that white water. And I don't know, if was there something there? Was there a seamount? We just didn't find it again. I don't know. But once we started to descend and it actually reoriented its, its longitudinal axis and it started mirroring us coming up, then it was obviously where we were there. And it was really coming up just, you know, you figure I'm at 20 and it's coming up and it ends up getting up to 12. 
uh, where I cut across the circle, I think it was very aware that we were there because it interacted. We call it a two circle fight when you're fighting another airplane. Um, but, uh, you know, was it, was, were we afraid? I don't think so. I mean, and to me, it was more curious, you know, the curiosity overcomes any fear that you would have. And I always felt to, to be honest, if I was inside the airplane, uh, especially as long as much time as I'd spent inside the airplane flying and doing stuff, I felt totally, it was like a safe zone. I mean, yeah. I, I felt totally comfortable inside the airplane as most, po you can't, if you're in the airplane and you feel scared, it's not the job for you. Right. You have to feel that because the airplane is part of you now. Yes. You know, I am inside, I have the stick, I have the throttles, I've got my Wizzo in the back seat, he's running all the displays. We are a team, we're in the state of the art airplane, you know, brand new, you feel pretty good. And then you get something that, you know, can climb from the surface up and then accelerate like it did, like it was like no big deal. You know, for an airplane, if, if you just put me from a standstill, let's just say slow flight, just get me at a hundred knots above the water. And for me to, you can't just start a climb. I'd have to lower the nose. I'd have to accelerate. And then I'd have to start coming up and this thing just like, just did it like it was like no big deal. Yeah. You mentioned that like you, kind of your reaction to it was uh, it like it's something that you would love to fly almost. Uh, so this object, just the curiosity you experience is like, like what it almost like, what the heck is that piece of technology and I want to fly it? Like what made you feel like it's something that you could fly? Do you think it's something that a human could fly? like in terms of interpreting what you saw as a piece of technology, because another perspective on it is it was uh, not, it, that the thing under the water was the key thing. And what you were seeing is some kind of projection or something that well, like- I don't think it was a projection. I think it was a real object. It was an ob a physical hard object that oh, yeah. you could be f flied. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think all, all four of us will tell you the same thing. It wasn't, it wasn't this was not, because you go, Okay, let's just go on a, th it's a light projection. Well, if we hologram. were both sitting next to each other, we were looking at it from the exact same angle and all that. And I go, oh, okay, there's a, in theory, you could have that. But with an 8,000 foot altitude difference flying, you know, and they're, you know, she's probably not directly above me. She's kind of hanging out watching this whole thing happen. You know, you're getting two different perspectives from two different altitudes over a clear blue, you know, if you've ever been at sea, and I don't mean like, coastal i mean like when you get out at sea the ocean is the bluest it's incredible um you know you got a bright white object over a deep blue ocean you got pretty high contrast and for this thing just to disappear uh it's it's wasn't i'm telling you i would i mean i know we we all have the same uh, recollection of what yeah. happened. You know, there's so some it's... details because it's so long ago, but for the most part, we know what we saw and we all came back and looked at each other like, what the hell was that? What if, I mean, do you think about the thing under the water that's not often talked about if there's something under the water? Couldn't have been something gigantic? <laughs> like, it could like be. What, like, it, do you ever think of- the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> Big ship I mean, that's why up. as a person, so I love like swimming out into the ocean. My mom's an Olympic swimmer, so like, I love that feeling, but I'm also terrified when I swim because the abyss, it could, anything could be under there. I Like there's not enough focus on that perhaps because there's no visibility, but is, a, is there anything interesting to say about the possibility that was anything underneath there? Could be, I mean, think about it. If you're gonna hide on this planet, where's, what's the least explored the spot on the planet? Two thirds of it's the ocean. You, there's, there's, there's literally, I mean, come on, the, 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 the Malaysia airplane, the, the triple seven, I think it was a triple seven that crashed, you know, they turned, they didn't go where they're supposed to, and they just disappeared and they've been searching for it and they found pieces of it. But you would think there's large objects that, you know, when that thing hit the water, depending on how it broke up, there's big pieces that would be, you'd find something. They haven't found anything except what floated. Um, so, if, so to hide something underwater, I think would be easy. 